Yeah. And then you're looking for the grant. Writing okay. Like that, well, it is 1.30, everybody. So let's go ahead and get started. We have a, a pretty a pretty packed pretty packed program today. Um, but I would love to welcome all of you to our annual meeting. Um, I'm Katie Fleming. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a Friends Community Engagement Director coming to you, like I said uh, before, live from Odd Fellows Hall on Orcas Island. It's really exciting to be here in the room with some people. And I'm from San Juan Island. So to get to another island today is a great thing too. Um, again, I'm so excited to welcome you to our annual meeting. Um, I would like to begin with a tribal acknowledgement. Friends of the San Juans respectfully acknowledges and honors the fact that this beautiful place we call home is compromised of the ancestral lands, waters, and natural resources of the Coast Salish peoples. The Coast Salish peoples have cared for and stewarded the San Juan Islands and the Salish Sea since time immemorial and continue to do so. And we honor their inherent Aboriginal and treaty rights that have been passed down from generation to generation. This afternoon, we're gonna share some testimonials from our members, um, then a conversation will follow between our executive director, Brent Miles, and our very special guest, Linda Mapes. Brent will also speak about Friends programmatic successes, our plans for the future, and opportunities for you to help support these efforts. You'll have a chance to ask Brent and Linda questions, um, and so please take note of any questions you have and put them in the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, in addition to Brent and Linda, you'll also have an opportunity to ask questions of our staff at the end of the program. So make sure you stick around until the end because we're also making a very special announcement. So um, wait for that one. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Now I'd like to introduce Michelle Vecved, our Director of Philanthropy. Thanks, Katie. As Director of Philanthropy for Friends, my job is creating and implementing fundraising strategy. But the best part of my job is listening to the member stories, how they're connected to these islands and why it matters, and their support for Friends. This is where I get my positive energy and my inspiration. It is the best part of my job. And with that, I would like to share with you a few testimonials. And I hope that they motivate you and move you as much as they do me. Thank you for your support. Here, let's watch a few. Hi, I'm Barbara Orchid. And I'm Jim Orchid. I'm here today to tell you why we support the Friends of the San Juan. We are second generation uh, on this locate on this island. Uh, my parents discovered it. My father discovered it in the 40s. They moved up here and uh, bought in the 70s and uh, discovered what a wonderful place this is. They appreciated it for the view. They appreciated it for the birds. They appreciated it for the wildflowers. And we learned to appreciate that too. We loved coming up here and have moved up here uh, following their footsteps. And we hope one day uh, to have our children able to access Lopez and the San Juans for the same reasons. They love it up here uh, and they love it for what's here. And that's why we support the friends. The friends. Uh, do such a wonderful job of not only promoting restoration, but also uh, keeping on top of things like the transit of freighters through our straits and the impact on whales and the environment. Unlike my spouse, I don't have a long family history of being on Lopez Island. However, she brought me here almost 45 years ago. And ever since then, I fell in love with the island and its wildlife and the fishing. Uh, and we've really hoped to preserve that, not only for our family, but for other families and, and allow them to enjoy the same thing well into the future. So we urge you to support the Friends of the San Juan so they can continue to do the great work they've been doing. <laughs> I second that. <laughs>
that was Tis a Gift to be Simple, an old shaker tune. And I am Gail Lynch of Lopez Island. Some 30 years ago, we came out to Seattle to visit our daughter. And as trying to figure out what to do to entertain us, she brought us out to Lopez Island. And of course we, like everyone else, fell in love with the place. The trees, the rocks, the water, the mountain views, um, they all appealed to us. And so we thought, well, you know, we could live here. So we did. We went back and packed up our things and with visions of more warmer winters and um, living on an island with a ferry, uh, we drove from the East Coast to the West Coast. And we've been here ever since. Why do I support this Friends of the San Juans? Well, all those things I mentioned that appeal to us about this place are very fragile. And so we need to, all the help we can get to help each other to try and protect them. And that's what the friends do. They, they're very people oriented. They do projects involving people and fixing tide gates and jet ski bands. And um, I like being a friend of the San Juans. I'm Ken Carrasco, and this is my wife, Marianne Carrasco, and we live on Orcas Island. We're members of the Friends of the San Juans, and I also serve on the board of directors, uh, pre presently serving as vice president. We're members of the Friends of the San Juans because both of us are biologists. Marianne was a wildlife biologist, I'm a marine biologist, and it's really important to be involved with an organization that actually gets things done. There's a lot of other organizations that do the trendy stuff, that the feel good stuff, but the work that Friends takes on is are issues that really make a difference. For example, updates to the county comprehensive plan, shoreline reconstruction, forage fish habitat, all those issues require a lot of hard work and actually make a difference in uh, the uh, in terms of the ecology of the local area. Uh, affecting the southern resident killer whales and generally our quality of life here on the island. I'm a retired wildlife and marine mammal biologist and I have a love and appreciation for all things wild along the ocean and along the shorelines. And I really appreciate all that Friends of the San Juan does to try and protect and restore habitat for all wild animals that live along the shoreline and in the ocean, especially of course the endangered killer whale that we have in our vicinity. My motivation for becoming a marine biologist and for joining the Friends of the San Juans comes a lot from my early adulthood when I was in the United States military. I served in the Coast Guard aboard a polar icebreaker for three deployments to north, north of Alaska and Siberia and twice south to the Antarctic. And I've become really alarmed in the meantime at how the ice caps have changed. We're changing the weather of the world. We're changing the planet that we live on. And Friends of the San Juans gives me the opportunity to do something about it. And I ask you to join us, to help support us in making a difference in our planet and our local area. Both Marianne and I <laughs> welcome you in helping us support the Friends of the San Juans as the Friends attacks the issues that really make a big difference in our local area to help us to, with the wildlife, to help us with the quality of life for humans here and for the planet in general. We ask you to support Friends of the San Juans. Hi, my name is John Vici. A few years ago, my wife and I had the opportunity to work with the Friends of the San Juans on a shoreline restoration project. We bought our property around 10 years ago, and it was, it was in a rough, a rough state. Um, the previous owner had uh, put a bunch of creosote, oil-soaked wood 
uh, uh, fixtures around the beach, a big retaining wall. Um, it smelled bad. Um, and there was sort of a, a lack of respect and appreciation for the life that was here. And when we looked at what to do, um, a friend had, had recommended we speak with the friends of the San Juans. And uh, we did. And they said, hey, we can help you with that restoration if that's something you want to do. And uh, it was a really daunting project because it was so much work. But they came in and then they helped. They helped us really look at the shoreline, the Salish Sea, and the ecosystem, not just as this resource for people, but as an entity and a thing to be appreciated and understood within itself. And they helped us see both what the benefits would be of that kind of restoration work, which is really long term, but also what are the steps that we could take and the things that we could be better aware of to make even better choices so that there could be just a, a, a greater abundance of life in the ecosystem and the ecology, as well as what that could mean for future generations of people that are visiting the shoreline and seeing it, whether it's by boat from afar or visiting the beach. And so um, it was really great to be working with them because that shift in perspective about having a really centered view and turning that into a, a looking as part of the ecosystem and what we could do to be a good steward of the shoreline was really valuable. And they were just in that moment, great during that project. But then even in other things, when we've looked at things that we could do on the land, them being a, a voice for the Salish Sea, a voice for that ecosystem, uh, kind of keeps that appreciation, that conversation alive. Looking back on the project with the Friends of the San Juans, it's really interesting to see how much we didn't know and appreciate. And one thing that I would encourage pretty much anyone on these islands to do is learn about the organization, see what they're doing, figure out how they can be helped. They're really a unique organization in that they're just there to, to help and they're there to think about and advocate for and improve the Salish Sea and the ecosystem that surrounds it. And doing that is, is so important because there's not another Salish Sea. You know, we talk about how there's one earth and we have to start taking better care of it. Well, that's true on the earth level but it's just as important on the local level. And they're one of the organizations and they're one of the groups of people out there who are there showing up every day to kind of help make the Salish Sea better. And that's something that everyone on the islands, whether they live here or whether they're visitors, can really engage with and figure out how to help them make this better for all of us. My name is Leslie Little. I'm an Orcas old timer now. I've been here 47 years and I have been a member of the Friends of the San Juans for almost that long. The Friends of the San Juans is a, is a nonprofit charity organization. And uh, the mission is to, is to protect uh, the islands from from overdevelopment to monitor and educate people to monitor uh, the islands and, and to restore to store the restore the balance between people and wildlife. People come here for all different reasons, but all of them have one reason in particular, and that is uh, that they they want a better life, and whether that means um, a better job with, uh, with construction or raising their children safe, more safely, or retired people who come here for the beauty and, and to uh, be part of smaller neighborhoods, to know their neighbors uh, and, and walk on the, in the beautiful trails that are all over. So although we may come for some different reasons, we all come for a better life. I would encourage any of you who also live here and care as I do for these beautiful, beautiful islands to join the Friends of the San Juans and, and help us to keep it beautiful and healthy. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sarah Hart. 
I moved to the San Juan Islands in 1972. So I've had the chance to uh, watch enormous amount of change over the decades. And uh, I actually moved away for 25 years and came back when I retired and was kind of appalled at uh, how much development there had been. And also very, very happy that there were organizations like Friends of the San Juans that were working hard to maintain the islands um, at, as to keep the places that we all love to be. To keep the islands the beautiful places they are, it's going to be a lot of work for all of us. And I hope that you will support the Friends of the San Juan and their ongoing endeavors, uh, which have been so important to the islands over the last several decades and will be far, far into the future. I'm Debbie Clausen, and I have enjoyed living here in the San Juan Islands for a couple decades now. And uh, as property owner on the shoreline, I've been enjoying the natural beauty and just the peace and quiet of the place that we live here on San Juan Island. And I'm Kim Sunberg. Um, I started coming up to the San Juans um, as a kid from Seattle with my parents in boat. And uh, then when I was in my uh, latter part of my undergraduate at, in oceanography at UW, um, I did a stint at the Friday Harbor Labs and uh, pretty much decided at that point as a senior uh, in college that I wanted to retire in the San Juans. Um, I subsequently uh, went up to Alaska and uh, met Debbie and we both had a career with Alaska Department of Fish and Game as habitat biologists and uh, we're fortunate enough to retire there and we moved back permanently to the San Juans in 2000. So one of the most important habitats here in the San Juan Islands are the natural shorelines and they are key to so much of the productivity of our Salish Sea and the nearshore coastal areas that the salmon are using and one of the key pieces are the forage fish that come and spawn along some of our beaches and the friends has done so much to help identify those critical beaches where the forage fish are spawning and that's work that I value um, greatly because once we know where those forage fish are spawning then we can do permanent protection for those really important beaches. So I was a first responder on Exxon Valdez in Alaska uh, in 1989 and I see that the Friends is uh, at the forefront of uh, work here to uh, prevent oil spills from impacting the San Juans. They do um, a lot of uh, uh, identification of the threats. They work with uh, various response organizations, including the U.S. Coast Guard, the uh, State uh, Department of Ecology, and others to uh, get the best oil spill planning and the best uh, prevention uh, efforts going uh, in place in the San Juans. And uh, I just want to say that um, that's another reason to support and uh, the work that the Friends of the San Juans does. So I would encourage others who love the islands the way we do to join and support the friends, all of their good work, their science work, their advocacy work for protecting those natural shorelines. And I think together we can keep this, uh, this island group as beautiful and productive as it is today. Hi, I'm Lisa Michelson. I, I live here on San Juan Island. I'm going on my 40th year. And my friend, Sean. Hi, I'm Sean Hubbard. Um, I am an Islander and an oak lover, a friend of Lisa and a friend of friends. Uh, friends of the San Juans. The, how I look at Friends of the San Juans is 
kind of like a, a guard dog or a watchdog. And they are the first ones that bark if there's any danger, uh, anything that needs protecting in our islands, uh, specifically about the environment. And they're the first ones to say, hey, pay attention. So I'm grateful to them for being in that capacity. And then they uh, ask people to help those who care. And I'm one of those who cares and um, would love it for other people to join in and listen to what the friends has to say. And I'm just grateful that they're the ones that, that make the first sound and say, wake up. I first was introduced to the San Juan Islands as a child when my family from Portland would come up to sail around in the summers. And that was in the 1970s. And we, I don't think we had any clue that the shoreline that we were enjoying had any risks to it, to development. And it, um, it was at risk, at great risk. And it wasn't until 1979 that the San Juan County got a shoreline management plan, a comprehensive growth plan. And that was largely because of the friends of the San Juans being there to coalesce and come together as a body to advocate for the shoreline and for the ecosystems and against rampant development um, so i'm really thrilled that there's friends that i'm a friend of the friends i wish every single person who bought property here or moved here could be greeted with a welcome wagon that said please join the friends educate yourself learn about the friends and you will inevitably want to be a friend of the friends of the san juans because that's who we turn to when we need support to protect this place. I think one of the benefits of being actively involved with the Friends of the San Juans is the community. Um, being able to work together on projects, having terrific leadership, the opportunity to learn more, um, being guided with how we can be effective together. And Sean and I were neighbors here on Katy Mountain for a long time. But until we both became involved with the Friends, shoreline protection and safe shipping projects, we weren't as close. And now we're, we're tight friends. And I look forward to meeting more people who are working on projects with the Friends and learning. Yes, yes, here, here. <laughs> My name is Peter Kavanagh. I'm a bird photographer and an ardent supporter of Friends of the San Juans. I'm speaking to you today from one of my favorite places in the whole world. This is the Tombolo, a narrow strip of land that separates the San Juan Channel from Fisherman Bay. I spend a lot of time here. I exercise here, I walk my dog here, and I spend hundreds of hours here with my camera photographing birds. I'm never disappointed by the things I get to see and photograph here. Sometimes it might be an immature bald eagle taking off against a blue sky from the tree over there. Or it could be an adult eagle fiercely grasping the branch as it lands in a strong headwind. Or it could be a lesser yellow legs, foraging for insects in the wetlands of the bay. Or a great blue heron battling a strong headwind. In the evening, I sometimes see cliff swallows hawking for insects and belted kingfishers hovering before diving into the bay to catch a fish. My passion for wildlife and my belief in the mission of the Friends of the San Juans are intimately connected. The birds are here because their preferred foods are here. Their foods are here because the water is clean 
and the shorelines and the marshes are protected from development. It's all part of the interconnected web of our island ecosystem that friends are committed to preserving. As Rachel Carson said in Silent Spring, in nature, nothing exists alone. Without strong advocacy for these islands, future generations will not enjoy the richness and diversity that we have today. Standing up for marine safety, wetland restoration, shoreline restoration, salmon habitat, these are just some of the things that the amazingly skilled and passionate staff of Friends do so well. If you value these islands, and their wildlife as much as I do, please dig deep and join friends during this annual campaign so that they can preserve these islands for future generations. One day, your grandchildren will be very glad that you did. Thank you so much to all of those members for their wonderful testimonials. Now I'd like to introduce George Lawson. I'm George Lawson, former uh, member of the board of the Friends of the San Juans, former president of the board, and uh, am currently fully engaged with the Friends uh, under the title, which uh, sounds more impressive than it really is, strategic advisor to the Friends of the San Juans. Someone has commented that when you're turned out to pasture, they make you an advisor. I'd like to introduce today two important people. One is uh, Brent Lyles, who's celebrating his first year anniversary as executive director of the Friends of the San Juans. Brent brings a tremendous amount of environmental and uh, nonprofit experience to this job. It's my great honor and privilege to introduce to you Linda Mapes, who is the environmental reporter for the Seattle Times. As a part of the introduction, I need to tell you that I live on Lopez Island at the end of a half mile road through the woods it's a ragged, rough, steep, difficult road. In 22 years that I've been there, no one has ever wandered down that road, except Linda Mapes and her husband, Doug, Doug McDonald. This happened a few years ago. We ran into each other, became fast friends. And uh, I think it's a symbol of who Linda is and in terms of depth and hard hitting journalism in the environmental uh, arena, particularly in the Pacific Northwest and the Salish Sea. Linda is, uh, digs down deeply. She goes where other reporter and journalists do not go. I think her middle name is Deep Research, and that is uh, what creates uh, we as readers with such fine knowledge of environmental issues in the Pacific Northwest. She has uh, recently come out with a marvelous book that you really should have for your library. It's uh, Shared Orcas, Shared Water, Shared Home, and it walks through in a beautiful, meaningful, easy to understand <clears throat> way, the challenges and the solutions to uh, the, the uh, issues facing the Salish Sea. Brent and Linda. Thank you so much. It's such Brent. a delight to be here. One second, <laughs> we're switching over. All right. I think it's just going to be one minute here. Okay. All right. Thank you. And George, thank you for that introduction. Linda, thank you for joining us. This is such an honor for me to get to be here with you and have this conversation. You are um, 
I mean, I don't think it's an overstatement that you're kind of a hero to a lot of the folks in our Friends of the San Juans community. And we've enjoyed your writing over the years and it's, it's terrific to have you here. Thank you for being part of this. Well, gosh, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. It's just wonderful to be on Arcus. It's a blustery day. It feels just like it should here in the fall and fresh wind off the sound. It's, it's magical to be here. Thanks for asking me. So I've got a couple questions for you, and then we're going to also have some questions from our audience as yeah. well. Um, you know, I wanted to start with, um, I, I, I almost started with like, you know, how did the book come to be? But I guess I want to get below the surface a little bit more and, and like, what drives you and what brings you to the work that you do? And what is it in your background that brought you to this career and, and where does your passion come from? Well, for me, it goes all the way back to the beginning. I was lucky enough to grow up feral. <laughs> My parents uh, planted us in a place with seven acres of woods and a nice stinky frog pond. And my mother would say, go outside and find something to do. And um, that was such a blessing for me. Every picture you see of me as a kid, I'm covered with calamine lotion and I have a black eye and I'm in my Girl Scout shorts and I'm outside. And lastly, I never really changed from that time. You know, to me, the wonder of nature is something that I grew up absolutely immersed in. And I, I, it's, it's just the magic every day of how does nature work? What is, what is the detail of how one miraculous thing fits to another. And I, I think in my career at the Seattle Times, I'm grateful that I've had the opportunity to pursue that curiosity. I mean, it's a family owned, locally owned paper We're celebrating our 125th year, believe it or not. And um, one of the things our publisher always tells us to do is um, cover news that you can't get anywhere else. So to me, that's about this place. It's about here. You know, what is the miracle of here? Um, and how do we preserve it for the future? Because I know all of us, whenever we go somewhere else, whenever we come back here, we're looking out that window from the plane and we look down and we see the sound and we see the islands and we see the forests, we see the rivers, the mountains without end. And we just think, oh, thank goodness. I'm so glad to be home. And that's, that's the preciousness. And that's really what drives me every day is to probe into uh, the miracle of what's here and um, the animals, the plants, the native cultures, the, and the task, honestly, of, of keeping what's here for the future. We're very lucky. It's not too late at all, but the things that we're doing to keep this place the living miracle that it is, we need to do a lot more of. I mean, this really is showtime for us here in the Northwest. It's time to bring it because honestly, everyone's going to be coming here in the climate change emergency that we are in. We are the last best place. And so, you know, we need to make sure that uh, as we think about the future, we need to take the lesson from the first people and think seven generations ahead and think about uh, keeping the miracle of here, not only now, but for the future. And we can do that. And I hope we'll talk more in our conversation about why we know we can do that. We know it because we're doing it now. We just need to do more of it. And I can give you some very specific examples of what's working. This isn't um, any kind of magic and hope is important, but it's not a plan. So we, we just need to understand and appreciate that we have um, a very special place to take care of and we know how to do it. We're better at it than anybody else in the world. We've already set the, the example for how to take care of this place for the world. Um, we'll talk more about that, but I want people to feel very energized and encouraged about where we're at and where we can go. Yeah, well, that's a great segue, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I want to hear what you hope people take away from the book, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's a terrific book, by the way. I, um, you know, as I've been here in this position as Friends of the San Juans, I've been trying to read everything I can, mm -hmm. right, to, to learn as much as I can. And um, one of the things I loved about your book is that it makes that, that connection between what's happening in our natural world and, and kind of the emotional content of that. Um, and, you know, you mentioned, you, you talked about things that are happening. You've been around the um, entire Salish Sea region and, and reporting and looking at issues. 
where do you see the work of Friends of the San Juans fitting into all of that? You, you actually know a lot about Friends of the San Juans already. Um, and you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Well, I can give you some really specific examples. So this, this work for me as on the book really started uh, covering the crisis with Mother Orca Talapot back in 2018. In the summer of 2018, she was the mother who happened to be a whale who changed the conversation about the Salish Sea because she gave birth to what at that time was the first birth from this population of endangered orca whales in, in many years. And that baby whale only lived about one half hour. Um, and she began to do something that scientists know that very sophisticated, socially connected animals, including orcas, dolphins, uh, others do, which is grieve. You know, she, uh, she wouldn't have let the calf go. She, she held on to it. She had to grip it by her teeth and hold it either by its little tiny dorsal fin or um, any way she could, balancing it on her rostrum, and had to remember every time she went down, make the decision to hold on to it again, to grip it again before the tide would take it away. And she did this not just for one or two days. She did this for 17 days and more than a thousand miles, Brent. And honestly, I don't think she ever let go. I think that finally just fell apart. And so as a reporter at the Seattle Times covering that, you know, uh, we made a decision at the paper to just stay with her and cover her journey because we felt like she was a witness and we needed to witness for her what she was really showing us about the Salish Sea, which was this place of incredible abundance for 10,000 years for this native species, could not support something as natural as giving birth to a healthy calf. What had happened? You know, what was it about? And so we decided the paper to go deep on that story and really go to the depth of the roots of this environmental crisis. And Telequa, um, she opened the door for that conversation because as I said, she was a mother who happened to be a whale. And anyone who ever lost anything could understand what she was going through. And so as we wrote about her, um, people from all over the world started following her story. I mean, by the time we finished that story, there were 6 million people around the world reading about Tahlequah. I was reading about it down in Austin, Texas at the time. There you go. Uh, and so to bring this back to the friend, I mean, what happened for me in the journey of uh, getting to the bottom of what, what had really happened here, why had she lost that calf? It very quickly led us, of course, to salmon, that this is a there are many populations of orcas, there's only one species, but the populations are all different in their food habits all over the world. They are the top predator. They eat what they eat though, and they don't, they're not generalists. They eat what they eat, but they've learned how to kill where they are. So, you know, for some of these orca whales, they'll, they'll literally rip the liver out of a great white shark, or they'll work together to rinse seals off of an ice flow up in the Arctic. Or if they're transient, as we see here in the San Juan Islands, they, they prey on marine mammals and they're incredibly good at it. They can even take out something as big as a sea lion. Well, for the Southern residents and the Northern residents, which are the same animal in a different location, their thing is salmon. That's what they eat, preferentially Chinook, especially in the summer, especially here. So what had happened, and we know this from um, some of the work that's come out of the UW Center for Conservation and Biology and some of the work uh, Deborah Giles has done with her work as scat sniffing dogs right here in the San Juan Islands, is that these animals were not getting enough to eat. They were under nutritional stress and that many of these pregnancy losses before they can even bring uh, the baby to term are happening because they're under nutritional stress. Well, what does that get back to? What that gets back to, of course, is the entire environment that supports salmon. This is what makes the, the orca so important. People often say to me, well, what if we lose the southern residents? Why does it matter? We'll still have the transients. Well, yeah, you'll still have black and white orcas swirling around and that's great. But the point is the southern residents are the animal of here and they've been here for 10,000 years. And not only do they have a right to be here, but they tell us something about here. If they're not getting enough to eat, if they're not getting enough salmon, what does that tell us about here? Well, it tells us a lot. It tells us that the freshwater streams and rivers that support the salmon, the forests that keep that water cool and clean, they're not the way they need to be either. And so it's a, it's a, it's a call to all of us who live here. If the Southern residents aren't doing well, that's a message for us. 
It's about our place, our communities too. You can think about the Southern residents as really an ancient society. These are not just random black and white animals. These are families and they have language, they have culture, they have breeding ceremonies. They live in tight family groups. They're very bonded to one another. The young never leave their mother for life. Well, what does that sound like? People very often say to me, oh, they're just like us. Well, the first thing I think is don't flatter yourself. <laughs> Because unlike us, you know, they, they, they peacefully live with other populations in the North Pacific. They don't war. They don't even fight with each other. And they stick together for life. Those family groups are absolutely bonded. But there really is a similarity in the sense that the Southern residents and, and we and here in the Pacific Northwest, we're people of place too. And this goes all the way back to the first people of this place. And there's a saying, there's a saying in Coast Salish country no little fish, no big fish, no black fish. What did I just make? I made a pyramid of connected beings. And here at the Friends of the San Juans, a lot of the work that I've done uh, with your scientists uh, has been about forage fish and it's been about natural beaches. Well, what do I mean by that? What I mean is a beach where you still have the incredible miraculous process of the continual shedding of the uplands down to the shore, replenishing that fine, that fine substrate, that forage fish, these little things that feed everything else, the herring, the, sand, the herring, the sand lance, they actually need to be able to spawn in eelgrass beds in the near shore. And the sand lance, they're called that because they actually need to spawn up in the upper beaches. Well, the friends of the San Juans have done a great job of explaining to people those connections. And it's as simple as this, this really three little parts seeing, which is, you know, orcas need salmon, need forage fish, needs natural beaches. You can put it on a t-shirt and you have. <laughs> you know, I think we can overcomplicate things. And the friends have done a great job of drawing that connection between the uplands and the beaches and the near shore and the salmon and those forage fish and that tight connection between the food sources of these animals. So if you've got forage fish, you're feeding those little baby salmon. They grow up to be those Chinook that feed the orcas. So, you know, the, the friends uh, for me have been an opportunity to learn about that. I've gone out on some of these forage fish surveys on the beaches with, with your scientist, Tina, your science director, Tina Whitman. And who would have ever thought that a fish would be spawning up on what is a dry beach? Why would that, why would you think that? You wouldn't think that. These are the kinds of things you have to learn like all of us, when we come to the Northwest, uh, need to learn how this place really functions. And that's, that's the job the Friends has been able to do. You know, you're a nonprofit. You're not out there to hassle anybody or find somebody. You're there to educate about, you know, those messy brambles over there. Those are actually super critical places for, for birds. And that, you know, that old bulkhead that really isn't serving any purpose for anybody anymore, if you could take that out, that would hugely help the beach nourish that near shore environment, which in turn will, you know, keep all those forage fish thriving so that the salmon can thrive. And it, it really is this connection between human communities and the natural communities that we love. And, mm -hmm. and we're in it together. We're absolutely in it together. We, we are at a time where they need our help in order to not only survive, but thrive and persist forever. And this is the kind of work that the friends is, helping all of us do with this education really about how it all works. You know, your book, there were parts of it that were hard to read. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of challenges out there for the orca to mm -hmm. put it mildly, right? Um, what, do you, what do you hope that people take away from that? Right, well, I hope people can feel very empowered because unlike a lot of some of the really troubling problems in our world that we don't even know what to do about or how to fix, world peace, uh, curing cancer, this one is as simple as cold, clean water running downhill. And you can count on it every time. You can count on nature. I mean, if you give nature space to recover, 
you can count on that every time too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we actually know what to do here in the Northwest to recover these natural systems. We're better at it than just about anybody. We've pioneered a lot of this science. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. So the Elwha Dam removal uh, out on the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State, this is still the largest dam removal ever in the country. Uh, a lot of people back in 1992 when the law was passed by Congress calling for this fisheries restoration said, oh, you shouldn't do it and you can't do it. And if you do do it, it'll never work. Well, we're now in the 10th anniversary of when the first dam started to come down. Uh, I got news for you. <laughs> 8,000 Chinook salmon adults came back to uh, the Illawarra River last summer. And I didn't even know how many came back this year. I mean, it is a spectacular success and so much faster than anybody expected. And we all love to talk about the salmon, but it isn't just the salmon. Mm -hmm. You have um, dippers of beautiful aquatic songbird that's obligate to rivers because they live off um, the little tiny beasties that live on decaying salmon carcasses and they eat salmon eggs. So they, the dippers in the Illawar River now um, are bigger in body size and the females are bearing double clutches, two rounds of young. Why? Because they're feasting on coho eggs. They hold them up in their bill like a glass of Merlot. <laughs> it's a beautiful sight. So the birds are back. Uh, there are more eagles in the lower river than there have been in a generation because they're feasting on yuacon that have also come back. Um, the beach. Welcome to Washington's newest beach. I mean, the, it used to be that walking on the beach at the Elwha River mouth was not a pleasant experience because it was just eroded to total bare cobble, turning your ankle. Go out there today, soft sand, beautiful sand, because it's all been released from behind those dams where it was penned up. And it, not only that, but it keeps going to the near shore where you, know, you have a, a whole reset of the native ecology. There's a crab fishery down offshore of the Elwha River. That hasn't been true in generations. And so we can think about this as not a miracle, but something people did that they decided to do mm -hmm. and it worked. And so what I, my message for people is, look, we know what to do. We know how to do it. We've actually shown the world how to do it. We just need to do a whole lot more of it. I mean, the, it's time to step up our game I mean, I would argue that what Washington State really needs at this point is, is not some new discovery about what to do, but just a lot more investment at the community level and at the state level in what we know works here. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of stuff sitting out there on the landscape left over from the, honestly, the early 20th century development of this place. I call it hydro trash. These are, you know, dams that don't even make a kilowatt for anybody, but they're just still sitting there because you've got a PUD that can't afford to take it out, or you've got old water diversions, you've got old bulkheads. There's all kinds of stuff out there that's impeding these natural processes that we know if we, if we remove these impediments to either the function of natural beaches or the migration of salmon, these processes will reset. You couldn't stop it if you wanted to. So you can count on nature and you can count on this work wherever we do it uh, being effective. But here's the other thing I know that every year these nonprofits and also these salmon recovery entities that we have all over the state of Washington put together lists for the legislature of critical projects that they know by a vetting process are the right things for their watershed. And every year the legislature can fund maybe five of them. Okay, so that's what I mean by we need to do more. We need a dedicated fund for salmon and orca as long as they have to compete uh, with everything else for the state tax dollars, they will never make it. They, they will not. And also at the community level, we all need to think about, you know, where can we step up, especially um, really to keep the promises that we all made when we came here and yeah. those treaties were signed with the first people of this place. You know, it's not just like a nice guy thing to do to preserve the salmon. This is a legal obligation. This is, you know, we all talk about a land acknowledgement. I want to talk about a promises acknowledgement. I mean, when then territorial governor Isaac Stevens went sailing around Puget Sound country in the depth of winter in 1855 with these uh, treaty councils, those were promises that were made by two sovereigns. And at that time, we'll just, because we're here in the Salish and we're, we're here in the San Juan Islands, which is the, the 
place of the Lummi Nation and other Coast Salish tribes from these islands. We'll talk about the Treaty of Point Elliot. I mean, at that time, one of the members of the Treaty Council um, said to Territorial Governor Stevens, well, how do we know that these promises we make here today will be kept? And he said, see that mountain? Pointing at Mount, we called it Baker, call it a different name. See that mountain? See that river? See that sound? As long as the tide runs, as long as the rivers run, as long as that mountain stands tall, that's how long these promises will endure. So those are our promises. That's our half of the deal. And you know, the, the tribe ceded millions and millions of acres by which we got clear title to all go on and now live in this shared place. Yeah. So um, you know, keep the promises of the treaty keep doing the things that we do better than anybody in the world by way of habitat restoration and preservation, preservation. Simple recipe, quit breaking stuff, fix what we can, where we can, and uh, share the joy of this place. You know, if, you, if you've got someone in your life who, who, who doesn't yet know the, the wonder of the outdoors and the delight and beauty of every day, that mm -hmm. there's something to discover and enjoy, you know, take them for a walk, take them on the beach, yeah. let, let them hear the sounds, let them feel the wonder yeah. because, you know, it, it's there to enjoy. Yeah. And, it, it, and that's what we need to do is, is hold on to our knowledge of the promises and our knowledge of uh, how to do right by this place and our sense of conviction to just do more and more of that. Yeah, thank you. You know, our friends at the San Juans, we've been talking a lot about stepping up our game and what it means to do more and and what it means to engage our community because it's really clear that more is needed and now is the time yeah um so i've got a million more questions for you but um we're gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna turn it back over to katie and we'll have time for questions from our audience in just a minute so thank you thank you thank you, thank you so much brent and linda um we'll be right back with questions like brent said but first, as you just heard, the need for Friends programs is growing dramatically, and your support will help Friends expand our work to meet the needs in the coming year, protecting the Salish Sea and its inhabitants. Here are three ways you can give right now. Thank you so much. And if you have a question and answer, or question and answer, if you have a question you would like answered, um, now would be a great time to put that in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Again, thank you for your support. All right, I am gonna put it back over onto Brent and Linda. Get you back over there. May need to do a little repositioning of our screen here, just a minute. Likes to go to sleep on us. Okay. Okay, there you are. Okay, let's see here. We are getting a few questions in here. So again, if you have questions for Linda or Brent, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. Um, we will start with, Brent, how do you see friends addressing some of the issues that seem urgent as it relates to the orca and what Linda has witnessed? Can you read that again, Katie? Sure. So how do you see friends addressing some of the issues that seem urgent as it relates to the orca and what Linda has witnessed? You know, that is a question that I would like to take about four hours to answer. Um, friends is, and, and, and this is maybe not directly answering the question, but Friends has spent a lot of the last year with the board and staff going through a strategic planning process. And as we've moved through that, we have created we, 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 well, there was, it was, a, it was a very deep and comprehensive process that started with assessing what's going on in the community and getting community input. And then the friends board and staff thinking about what we heard and what we learned from that community engagement process, and then talking about the challenges that are ahead. And what we developed were seven key strategic priorities. And 
where we're at today. And I, I, there's a video that I'll be sharing in just a few minutes with you, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but where we're at today is translating those priorities into action plans for the next five years. And certainly the ORCA are a big part of, you know, friends, um, we have been involved with that for uh, as long as we've been an organization practically. And um, the challenges on the horizon for us, for our community, our climate change and rapid pace of development, the migration to the Pacific Northwest um, that was mentioned. And in a few minutes, I'm gonna be uh, sharing that video where we talk about some of the programs that we're working on right now. And I think that'll be a more specific answer to your question, but it's kind of two, two parts for me. One is the very specific on the ground programs, but then stepping back and looking at the bigger picture of where does Fred, Friends fit into the puzzle of helping our community be climate ready, and how do we address the, the challenges that are before us right now? Um, kind of that combination of the big picture and the specifics. Thanks, Brent. Linda, you did touch on this a little bit already, but do you have anything more to say about the meaning of the treaties today in regard to protection of the place that we love here? Yeah, I think the, the power of the treaties uh, is something to understand, not as something in the past. Well, that was a long time ago, 1855, we're done with that. Uh, I think the thing to understand is the incredible benefit of these treaties to everybody here in the Northwest. I mean, let's remember the coal port that was proposed for just offshore of um, Valleyham. This was gonna be the largest coal port anywhere in North America. Well, the reason that's not happening is because the Lummi Nation went forward in defense of their crab fishery and their fishing rights uh, to say, actually, you know, you, you all like signed a promise back in 1855 that we were going to be able to catch fish forever in our usual and accustomed places. Well, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers took a look at that and said, I guess we'll just like cancel the EIS. We don't even need to finish this. We're so done because that's true. You know, you can't have the largest container ships in the world coming in here with a load of coal while you're trying to catch a crab. So that was that. Um, that's a treaty right. And that's, that's what treaties mean. It doesn't just mean back in 1855, it means today. It means that if you've got a culvert that's undersized and, and obliterating a salmon run where it's trying, this fish is trying to travel just like we're trying to travel mm -hmm. if our highways and our culverts and our travel is busting up their travel that's a problem and the, yeah. the tribes in western washington went all the way to the u.s supreme court to explain to all the rest of us that when their ancestors reserved that right to fish it wasn't just a right to fish it was a right to catch salmon and so you know, I'll, I'll often hear this from tribal leaders saying, we just need to be able to catch more fish so we can be who we are. This isn't just a science thing or just numbers thing. This is a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. This is about people uh, being able to be who they are in this world today as Indian people in this shared place with us, which doesn't mean we obliterate it all with development and they get whatever's left. No, it doesn't mean that. It means we've made a deal, we made a promise, and it's a shared promise about a place that will have a living ecology forever that supports treaty rights to fish, to hunt, to gather roots and berries. This is to be a living place. Now, who are we? We're friends of the San Juans talking today. So obviously this is not a hostile agenda. This is a shared agenda. What's your, what's your, your program? It's healthy seas natural shorelines, and yes, thriving communities. That means everybody. And so the treaty promise and the treaty protection is for everybody because it's about healthy seas, living shorelines, and healthy communities. So I, I guess I just want to bring this up because we're about to come into the treaty signing time. Much of these treaties here in Western Washington were signed um, in December. And so when that day comes, it's Indigenous Peoples Day on Monday, it's a good time to think about this history. And if you don't know it, uh, learn more about it because it's really not only about some distant time or some other people, it's about all of us and our shared lives in this place. And, and I wanna uh, take a little crack at the question that you were asked about, you know, how do you deal with this work of urgency thing as friends of the San Juans? I got a three part program for people who live here. 
plant it, don't break it, and take care of it. You know, if you're, if you're living someplace that someone before you uh, scalped or, or whatever it was that happened, this is your opportunity to learn about the native plants and uh, landscape and, and try to hook that, you know, so that nature can have a little boost in healing. Um, you know, take care of it yourself and, and like, don't certainly don't make it worse. I mean, we were, we were at a property uh, just the other evening and it was incredibly inspiring. This is John, you heard from him earlier when he and his wife Maya came on the landscape, they, they decided to, um, you know, rewind the history and they set their house way back so that the natural shoreline could recover and it cleaned up enormously. A lot of creosote that was on the property and Gosh, we were there last night, Brent. It was, it was, it couldn't have been prettier. There were all kinds of seagrasses and things that had come back to life in just 10 years. This is what I said earlier. If you give nature the chance, nature comes back. And I, you can count on it every time. Thank you. Okay. I, yeah, it's time to move on for now, but um, let me get, I'll get you back here on me. But thank you so much um, to both of you for that conversation. And um, now what I'd like to do is um, move on to uh, even more of a message um, from Brent about the work that we've accomplished this past year to help um, meet all these issues that we just discussed um, and a little bit more about how you can be involved. Hello, my name is Brent Lyles and I have the honor of serving as executive director of Friends of the San Juans. Thank you for joining me here today. It means a lot that you've set aside this time for Friends of the San Juans. I love our annual meeting because it's a time for reflection where we can look back on our accomplishments and successes of the past year. And it's pretty gratifying. We've done a lot in the last year to fulfill our mission of protecting and restoring the San Juan Islands and the Salish Sea for people in nature. As most of you know, I'm still kind of the new guy around here. I've been executive director for a little over a year now. And in that time, we've really come a long way, both programmatically and organizationally. I want to, I want to talk about our organizational successes, but first let me focus on the programmatic stuff. It's been a big year. So let me share a few highlights with you. Uh, first off, our restored beach on Susha Island, which you'll hear about in a separate video segment, is doing great. In our ongoing monitoring at this site, we're seeing fish way back in the furthest reaches of that restored salt marsh, which indicates that the salt marsh ecosystem is recovering and seems to be getting stronger by the day. Friends of the San Juans has been working on several shoreline improvement projects this year, uh, not to mention consulting with lots of property owners to explore potential new restoration sites. And in, in, in every case, we're partnering with landowners, government agencies, with other organizations, local contractors, and volunteers to help improve our county's shorelines for the forage fish, for the salmon, for the orca, and more. Speaking of forage fish, Friends is about to wrap up a countywide analysis of the shoreline armoring projects that have appeared on our private property shorelines in the last 10 years. So looking back at 10 years of data, what we've discovered is that less than 15% of those new shoreline armoring projects were fully permitted with the required local and state permits. Less than 15%. That means 85% were not fully permitted. And, and that's a big deal because it's the permitting process that helps landowners understand and follow the environmental protections that are in place. So these data, this new study will help Friends of the San Juans open up productive, proactive conversations with our county and state agencies about how these projects are getting built without their permits and, and what we can all do together to work on improved tracking of conditions on the ground and not to mention effective enforcement. Another project that's wrapping up soon is our updated infographic that focuses on Salish Sea vessel traffic projections. So we periodically update this study to provide a snapshot of all the recently constructed and proposed or permitted port and refinery projects across the Salish Sea, including up into Canada. The purpose is to understand the cumulative increase in large commercial ships and tankers moving back and forth across the Salish Sea. 
what we found out through this analysis is that if all of the approved and proposed projects are completed, there'd be at least a 25% increase in ocean going vessel traffic. And it's likely much more than that since we have data for Canadian projects, but many of the projects in Washington state haven't released their data. Increases in vessel traffic increase the underwater noise that interferes with orca hunting and social behavior and increased vessel traffic also increases the risk of accidents and oil spills that would impact the entire marine ecosystem, including the critically endangered orcas, not to mention our economy and our way of life. This is important stuff and it helps policymakers make decisions. <clears throat> Also this year, here at Friends, there's been a big expansion in our work with middle and high school students. We've grown our environmental mentoring program for high school students, which this year for the first time is expanding beyond San Juan Island to include students on Orcas Island as well. Friends of the San Juans has also developed a program that teaches students about marine food webs using virtual reality technology. Uh, let me tell you, it is super cool that local students can use these VR headsets to dive underwater with the salmon. Um, it's awesome. They're learning a lot, uh, thanks to friends. And of course, our work continues to closely monitor everything from new construction permits across our county to port expansion permits across the Salish Sea and more. Just last week, we submitted comments objecting to an enormous and environmentally insensitive airplane hangar that was planned for the Roche Harbor area. We are out there in the community keeping an eye on this stuff to ensure that laws and environmental protections are being followed and enforced in a fair and equitable way so that our community works together to protect what we all love about these islands and our way of life here. <clears throat> And here at Friends, we're not, we're not afraid to pursue legal action when nothing else works. Right now, we're involved in three different legal cases, one involving a, an unpermitted bulkhead that wrecked a likely forage fish spawning site and, and was built over the county's objections. Another case involving a formal assessment of environmental impacts that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers should have done years ago. And a final case that involves holding Philip 66's feet to the fire, and, and you probably remember that we're involved in this one, it's still going on. Uh, Philip 66 is appealing the decision that came down this last year in our favor. Um, through this case, we're making sure that this oil and gas giant is forthcoming about the impacts of their facility expansion projects to the endangered orcas and, and our other neighbors, friends, and relatives across the Salish Sea. Another project that's been going on this year and will continue into next year is that Friends of the San Juans is heavily involved in our county's comprehensive plan update process to make sure that environmental stewardship and climate action are front and center as our county plans and sets the rules for how it will grow over the next 10 to 20 years. We've created a comp plan action team of concerned community members like you to help build and show public support. Just yesterday, I spoke at our county's planning commission meeting, helping the commissioners understand the links between environmental stewardship and providing housing for families at a variety of income levels. Housing is an environmental issue. Um, okay, so I could keep going uh, because there's so much more. If you're getting our monthly newsletters in your email, you've read about lots of things we do that I haven't mentioned here yet, like helping lead our community's efforts in plastics reduction and waste management, um, mapping the spawning sites of forage, fi forage fish across our county with the help of tons of volunteers, um, helping ensure that recreational and commercial boaters do their part to protect eelgrass beds and stay clear of the pregnant orcas. Um, and let's not forget the policy work at Friends. We are proactively making sure that when policy decisions are being discussed that affect our county's habitats and shorelines and rural character and climate readiness and long-term environmental vitality, when these things are being discussed, Friends of the San Juans is at the table. This last year has been astounding. Um, not bad for a staff of eight, most of whom are part-time. You know, in my, in my time here over the last year, I've been so impressed with the skills and capabilities and like the professionalism 
of our staff here at Friends of the San Juans. I'm so lucky to be able to be right here, right now, talking about this. I'm surrounded by incredibly smart, incredibly dedicated, um, amazing people at Friends of the San Juans, both on staff and on the board. So on top of all of these programmatic efforts to champion the environmental vitality and resilience of the San Juan Islands and the Salish Sea, our organization has also been on a learning journey in the past year. One of the things that I've been able to bring to the organization is lots and lots of experience in organizational development and best practices. So behind the scenes in the last year, we've updated our financial policies and procedures. We've gone through and improved our HR systems and policies. And importantly, we've worked on improving work-life balance for our staff and, and worked on how we communicate with each other. Together with our board of directors, our staff went through a fairly intensive training series this last year on how to build an equitable and inclusive organization. We are still very much on that learning journey, but I've, I've honestly been very proud to be part of an organization that's taking its own pursuit of excellence so seriously. And so with that, we turn our gaze to the future. As some of you know, in January of this year, Friends of the San Juans began a deep and comprehensive strategic planning initiative. As we began, we knew that getting the community engaged in this was gonna be critical. So we started with a large focus group of community members from across the spectrum, representing a lot of different viewpoints, including members of Friends and non-members, um, indigenous thought leaders in our community, government representatives, other nonprofits, uh, even people that haven't always agreed with us. Uh, we wanted to hear all of these voices. And from there, we also conducted stakeholder interviews and polled our members and the general public. Led by Makata Wilborn, who is an outstanding facilitator, by the way, our staff and board had a series of meetings to discuss the results of all of those community engagement efforts. What did we hear? What did we learn? With those results in mind, we then launched into discussions of the opportunities and challenges on the horizon for friends. We assessed our current programs and capacity. We conducted an analysis of other organizations working on similar issues in this area. And then from there, we began to plan. Our board and staff developed a set of seven key strategic priorities for our organization to help guide us over the next five years. And, and where we're at today, is translating those key strategic priorities into on the ground, measurable, achievable action plans. We'll be sharing those plans with you in the coming months, but there are a couple of things that I can share right now. First of all, first off, we heard loud and clear that there is still a lot of good, solid alignment between our community's greatest needs and what Friends is working on we're still doing the right things. Uh, the orcas still need our help and same goes for the salmon they depend on and the forage fish they depend on and the natural shorelines and beaches they depend on. Friends is doing protection and restoration and policy work in these areas that no one else is. No one else is watching out for the huge mansions that are being planned right on top of sensitive habitats. And <clears throat> no, one, no one else in the San Juans is tracking the impacts of shipping vessels through our waters. The work of Friends of the San Juans, all of these programs that I was just describing to you a minute ago, it all still matters. So we came out of the strategic planning process, not with a mandate for our organization to change, but with a mandate for Friends of the San Juans to grow. Why? Because the needs are growing. Now, I'm speaking to the choir here, but every day, more and more people are moving to the San Juan Islands. The folks I've heard from in the real estate industry say they've never seen anything like this. The development pressures are higher right now than they have ever been. And in the next few years, those pressures will, will grow more and more quickly. The, the migration of people to the Pacific Northwest and to, our, and to our islands in particular is just one aspect of how climate change will profoundly impact the San Juan Islands in the coming years. 
and, and, and you know the rest, uh, hotter, drier summers with increased wildfire risks, more severe storms, a sea level that's expected to be two feet higher in Friday Harbor in my son's lifetime, sharp economic disruptions that affect all of us and will affect certain segments of our local population in life-threatening ways, massive mass extinctions of species, right? Um, it's not coming, it's already happening, but it is going to get worse. And who is doing something about it? Who is fighting for climate action in our local government? Who is helping our community transition away from plastics? Who is protecting our endangered species? Who is helping our community, and especially our young people, understand the risks and the impacts of climate change through education programs? It's Friends of the San Juans. We get up every morning and we come to work and this is what we do. But, but it hasn't been enough. The changes that need, that need to happen in our community are not happening fast enough. Friends of the San Juans has to do more. We need to grow our impact and we need to make sure that the work we do is effective. And we need more, more people working on this with us. That means growing our programs. And it also means growing our organizational capacity. If there was one organizational challenge that was identified during our strategic planning process as, as a weak spot, as, as having room for improvement, it was communication. <clears throat> Here at Friends, we haven't done a terrific job of communicating with our community. You know, there are people out there who, who have misconceptions about us. There are people out there who don't understand the breadth or the, the importance of our work. There are people out there that we've rubbed the wrong way and you know they, they should have been our allies in this climate work you know and and heck as i've gotten to know my neighbors i've been kind of surprised to find out how many people don't even know that the organization exists or maybe it's like yeah friends of the san juans is is that the same thing as the preservation trust um so we've got to do a better job of reaching out we've got to do a better job of communicating we've got to get our messages out there more effectively one of the things I've heard Linda Mapes say over and over again is that more people need to step up and get engaged. More people need to be working on this and working together to save the orca and, and save ourselves. So in the coming year, one of my highest priorities for Friends of the San Juans, in addition to looking at how we can strategically grow our programs, is to level up our communications capacity so that this community's coalition of people working on environmental and climate issues just grows and grows. More people getting educated about the issues, more people getting engaged, more people understanding what's needed, more young people coming to the table, more people becoming part of the solution. And so for Friends of the San Juans, how do we do that? Building our capacity for excellent communication strategy means staffing. And whether that's hiring a communications expert to come in or, or hiring someone in-house to be our director of communications or, or some combination of both, it takes money. So when you think about your support for Friends of the San Juans in the coming year, and you're thinking about how to make a tangible difference in the world based on your values, right? your, your, your philanthropic priorities, if you decide to support Friends of the San Juans, I want you to know where your money is going. It's going to support the growth of our environmental and climate programs. And it's going to support the growth of our organization. The needs are growing and so must we. Friends of the San Juans is gonna continue building our coalition. And we're gonna continue being a leader in this community and in this region to advance environmental stewardship and to be a champion for meaningful climate action so that our grandchildren's grandchildren can still enjoy the awesome beauty of the San Juan Islands and the Salish Sea. And so that this area is still healthy seven generations from now. In closing, I wanna say thank you. If you're on the line right now listening to this, chances are you're already a supporter of this organization's work. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. You've made 
all of these successes in the past year possible. And you've also made it possible for us to create our ambitious plans for the next five years. This next year, the next five years are going to be absolutely critical. With development pressures and climate change, we have got to get this right. And we cannot do it without your partnership in this. As Friends of the San Juans looks ahead to our year-end fundraising, which begins today, right now. As we look ahead to that, thank you in advance for joining us again in this work and for your generous and impactful support. Right, thank you so much, Brent. Um, now we're gonna transition to a Q&A with our staff. Um, so while I bring, um, bring all of our um, staff and some of our interns even too in to be panelists, we're going to show you another video about what we've been up to the past year, our Susha Island um, project, a restoration project video. Again, to give you an idea of what our staff has been up to and what some of our programs have looked like the past year. So enjoy that. And when we come back up, we will um, be ready to answer even more of your questions. Located in the northwest of Washington State, the San Juan Islands are a unique area known throughout the world for its beautiful landscapes and iconic orca whales. Two and a half miles north of Orcas Island, Susha Island is treasured for its anchorages, trails, and beaches, including Mud Bay. If healthy, these shorelines support forage fish, which in turn support salmon and southern resident orcas. Historically, Susha's Mud Bay hosts beach habitats where forage fish incubate their eggs, safe from predators, and a salt marsh that provides a vital habitat for juvenile salmon on their way to the ocean. Over a period of 80 years, people added fill, rock, armor, and a road across the beach and marsh at Mud Bay. Though seemingly small, these developments carried a big impact, preventing water and wildlife from accessing spawning and rearing habitats, and preventing the site from adjusting to rising sea levels. So one of the real intents of this project was to restore natural processes. Here we have a moderately low wave energy environment, but we still have the waves coming onshore. We have vegetation drift logs in motion and we have the salt marsh and the tidal exchange back and forth. So with the armor in place and the old roadbed, everything was fixed and wasn't able to adjust. So the barrier beach wasn't able to roll over. Sediment was not able to move along shore freely with the various concentrations of armor and the tidal flow was greatly constricted. Seven years ago, Friends of the San Juans began collaborating with Washington State Parks and coastal engineers to come up with a plan to restore Mud Bay. Led by Friends Science Director, Tina Whitman, the project embarked on a thorough planning process grounded in research, surveys, designs, engineering, and permitting to end up with a salmon recovery project that directly benefits fish and provides a more natural experience for parks visitors. Well, I'm really grateful to work in the San Juan Island community with all the different uh, nonprofits and public land entities out here because we work really well collaboratively. And this project is a perfect example of how we're stronger together. We can come together to accomplish common goals, resource protection, working with forage fish, salmon, ultimately the whales. This is a project we wouldn't have done on our own. Mike Carlson Enterprises removed the old service road by bringing in heavy earth movers on a barge. I grew up in the island, so I, you know, I love the island and it's fun to be on the boat and figuring out how to get all the materials here and organize the schedule and pull it off, turn it into three dimensions. It was a very enjoyable project. I enjoyed working with friends and great teams to work with. The engineers were great, good too. I think the end result of what we did, what we took out and the way we're leaving the beach is a real plus for everybody. With the road and associated armor and fill removed, the beach was nourished with appropriate sized sand and gravel for spawning forage fish, supporting the food web for salmon. A new low impact road was installed at an inland location to allow full restoration of the shoreline and better address the needs of Washington State Parks. A 
At the project's conclusion, San Juan Island Civilian Conservation Corp added plants to the restored berm to make it more resilient and to restore its original function and appearance. It was amazing to see the tide coming into the salt marsh unimpeded for the first time in over 75 years. The restored habitat will directly support juvenile salmon, forage fish, and through marine food webs, our endangered orca. A successful project, Mud Bay stands as an example of Friends of the San Juan's ongoing mission to work collaboratively to protect and restore the San Juan Islands for both people and nature. Thank you so much for joining us today and for your continued support in protecting what you love about our shared waters and our shared home. I would also like to give a very, very special thank you to the folks who helped us put this on today, the folks we couldn't done, have done this without. Um, that's Carl Davis, who's busy right now, still helping with lighting and all sorts of stuff here. Um, Peter Cavanaugh, who helped us with those wonderful um, member testimonials. And I'll just go down a list again of all the people that made this possible. Paul Mayer, George Lawson, David Turnoy, John Slater, to all of our board members and staff as well. And of course, Linda Mapes. We also appreciate the support of Braided River Publishing. Here's the special announcement that you probably, I hope you stuck around for. We're going to be offering a signed copy of Linda's new book to all participants today. We will contact you to make those arrangements. So everyone who, who stuck, stuck with us uh, through the event will get, to, will get one of these wonderful, wonderful books. Now I'd like to introduce our staff. Um, if you stick around for a bit with all of us, um, you can ask questions and you know, anything you want to know. Um, so go ahead and start putting those questions in the Q&A box and we'll start to have everybody popping in. So um, bear with us for a minute while we do that. And thank you so much again for being with us today and for all your support of Friends of the San Juans. And with that, I'm gonna start to get our staff popping in here. Shannon, our grants manager. Tina, our science director. Let's get um, Jess, you're gonna share your video, right? There's Jess. Jan coming in from Shaw. Lovell coming in, Maddie. Let's see here, as so I'm bringing everyone in, um, so I want, I'm gonna go ahead and ask a question as I bring everybody else in here. And, and Tina, you may um, have an answer for this one um, if you wanna go to unmute, but there's a question of, um, can we speak to the problems related to growler jets and our involvement in any, in any progress? What can you tell us about that while we bring everybody else in? Yeah, thanks, Katie. I actually have not been super involved in our participation with that. I know that our previous staff attorney Kyle Loring did a lot of work with groups on Whidbey um, and in the islands regionally. Um, I think Lovell perhaps is the one that's that's kept up with, with where that's going. Um, but I do think we're providing sort of technical support to citizens groups um, on that topic. And Lovell should be popping up here. Let's see, there she comes. Lovell, do you have anything else to say about the growlers? Sure, um, I am a member of the San Juan County Marine Resources Committee and earlier this year we co-hosted a webinar on this topic with Western Washington University. And I think the link to that is available on our website, um, but if it's not, we can make that available. People can see the recording of the webinar and the scientists who have been um, doing more research about the impacts of growlers and the fact that the growler noise can be heard up to a hundred feet underwater. Um, so we can make that available to folks. Great, here comes Brent, let's see. Okay, um, let's look in here. I'm still, still trying to get everybody up here, um, but more questions. 
So here's another good one here. Any progress with kelp forests? We've noticed shrinkage off of Lopez over the last 15 years or so. Um, sure, I'll jump in on that one. Um, there have been some declines in kelp as people are noticing around in the San Juans and across Washington state. Um, Friends was involved back in 2007 with Department of Natural Resources and we mapped Bull kelp countywide. And then the Samish tribe most recently, I think in 2018 and 19, used that base map and new aerial photos and did document a loss of about 30%. Um, both Jess Newley and I are on um, kind of a regional work group thinking about what are the options for restoration um, for kelp and also for protection. There's not a lot of tools in the toolbox yet for what we do to protect kelp. Um, it's very sensitive to you know, ocean changes and temperature, um, but there are some um, projects happening around the sound and we'll kind of be staying tuned and, and seeing what we can do here locally. Great. Okay, going up here. I love this one. And this is something that maybe, um, yeah, whoever wants to answer can answer this one. What keeps you up at night and how can members help friends? I could talk for the next hour. Just kidding. This annual meeting has kept me up at night and now I'm glad we're almost, no, I'm just teasing. It's, it's been a great day. No, I, um, I'm going to let any, someone else answer that. You all have heard a lot from me today. You know, I'll, I'll be happy to share my thoughts on that. You know, I, I think what keeps me up at night is that there feels like there's a lot to do, right? Um, the challenges are many, the challenges are growing. And it, it for a, an organization like ours that is working on a lot of different aspects of the environmental stewardship puzzle and the climate change readiness puzzle, um, it, it you know, it, you have to keep asking yourself on an ongoing basis, am I working on the right thing? Am I working on the thing that's the highest priority? And for me, that was one of the great benefits of going through the strategic planning process that we did in the last year is because it helped us think about what our priorities should be moving forward. Um, and we still are, as I said in my video just a minute ago, we're still in that, in that and we are creating kind of the action plans based on our priorities. But, um, you know, that's, that's what I'm thinking about is, um, you know, how do we, how do we do all this um, and, and still keep our sanity? How do we hang on to the hope? How do we be good to ourselves and be good to each other um, and be good to our community? Um, it's hard work. It is really hard work to get up every day and do the work that we do. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I um, it's, it's, it, 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 will, it is not possible for us to do this alone, right? And sort of that kind of brings in the question of how can members help, right? Um, and it's keep supporting this because and keep partnering with us, keep volunteering with us, keep um, helping us make those connections and help keep helping us get this work done. Um, it's critically important. Anybody else wanna answer that? It's a great question. Um, I'll go. Um, one of the very fun things that I get to do as part of my work here at Friends is that immersive education, virtual reality education program that Brent mentioned earlier. And um, part of that is documenting forage fish along our shorelines to take students under. And I'm constantly thinking about all the herring that I'm missing out on when I'm not in the water. So that's what, so I have sweet dreams of herring. And luckily me and Catherine, our um, new education intern who's online right now, hi Catherine. Uh, last Sunday we got to go out and swim amongst the kelp forest with the herring. So that was a really nice treat. Anybody else? All right, well, there is a follow-up question to, um, to the kelp question, Tina. How practical would it be to configure a barge like an old fashioned manure spreader and tow it over eelgrass beds, feeding material to stimulate bank erosion? Good question. <laughs> yeah, that is a good question. Um, I am not sure exactly what you're thinking in terms of that, in terms of just getting more sediment, you know, mimicking our feeder bluffs possibly. Um, 
and allowing that. I think that the angle that Friends is really working on is let's keep those natural processes happening where they're happening. So let's make sure those old modifications that Linda was talking about, right? There's a lot of old weird stuff out there that we can take out that won't be blocking um, or that is blocking sediment supply. Let's restore um, this natural sediment supply. Um, eelgrass beds, right? They want the sandy, gravelly beaches. They need that sediment over time. And I just want to, I have a, had a comment come in, maybe you all could see that in the chat, but, um, you know, great to see Kaya Olson, you know, we um, certainly have tried so hard to, well, not tried hard, it's easy when you have people like Kaya and Maddie and Catherine and our, you know, these are our, these are our interns if you haven't seen their faces before, but, um, but yet the young people coming in and helping us, it's, um, it's so important and it's so inspiring and, yeah, I have to say, yeah, Kaya, you especially are a superstar with, with all of that. So thank you. So it is good to see your face. This is why we're doing it, right? For all of us, but for these future generations too. Let's see. I, I, haven't, Any, I haven't gotten yeah, to see I, Kaya in a while. Hi, Kaya. <laughs> it's good to see you. Well, it looks like, let's see, that may be, that may be it. Oh, let's see, no wait, um, here's one. Would you encourage members to call our county councilors to say that regulations should be effectively enforced? Uh, yes, hey members, would you please call our county councilors and try to make sure that our regulations are effectively enforced? Thanks. No, I agree, enforcement is such a big issue and uh, it's actually something Friends is working on uh, kind of behind the scenes, so, but, but all, all the more, you know, the more people we can get kind of demanding that, the more likely it is to happen. Um, and as we look ahead to our elections, right, like making sure that we're finding people and supporting people who are running for those elected positions who, who, who have that as a priority as well. Okay, there's one more question before we go and it, um, whoever wants to answer it can answer it. Um, but how can our community help to protect what we love in the San Juan Islands? Support friends of the San Juans, get engaged, become part of it. I don't Easy. know, that's like, that's kind of cheating as an answer, right? Yeah, and I would say, you know, talking about like what Jess was talking about getting underwater, get out there, know this place, explore, love it, learn more about it um, and share that knowledge with someone else. Um, the more people who love this place um, and really understand it, the better we'll be off. And again, we're preaching to the choir here, right? Our members, are, you guys are, are really engaged with us, um, but share the information with someone else. Yeah, that's what I was just about to say too. You know, for, for everyone who's on the line right now, you're, you're already part of this. And what we need is, is more. We need more people in our community engaged with this. And so don't be afraid to have those conversations. Um, pretty soon, hopefully pretty soon, uh, fingers crossed, Friends of the San Juans is gonna start having more in-person events, right? And, and bringing people to those events who may not be familiar with our work would be terrific. Um, we need to be doing everything we can to reach out to more people. Anybody else want to answer that one? Good answers though. Um, well, let's see, I'm going to make sure nothing else has come in, but I think that that is it for the day. And if, if I missed anything here, um, please get in touch with us. Um, you can find our email addresses on our website, our you know, office phone number, sometimes we're there, but certainly, or email me. A lot of you have my um, email address from registering for this event. Um, it would be great. Um, to talk with you more. And if we miss something, please let us know. But again, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for all your support. Um, thank you again to everybody who helped make this event happen. And now I hope everyone goes and enjoys the rest of this fall weekend out there. It sure does feel like it out there now. So thank you again. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.